That was kind of weak or no response at all. Good afternoon, GYC. I'll be introducing our evening speaker for, um, for today, and I don't really think he needs an introduction, but um, Pastor David Ashrick is a co-director for Light Bears Ministry and also the co-founder for Arise, and I've actually had the privilege of having Pastor Ashrick as my teacher several years ago at Arise. And while there are several things I appreciate about you, hmm. um, one thing stands I'd, out. I'd love to hear them all. We have time. <laughs> um, well, one other thing is your ability to able to connect with everyone, but especially the young people, not, at, not just at the intellectual level, but at the heart level as well. Hmm. And I have no doubt that the important message you have for us today will do just that. And I'd like Amen. to pray with you I'd love before that. you start. You're only going to say one thing then? We'll get the others later. <laughs> All right. Dear Father in heaven, I just want to thank you so much for bringing each and every precious soul here this evening. And I just ask that as we come before you with um, empty hearts and open minds, and I just ask that you uh, fill us with your Holy Spirit and with the message that you have for us this evening through Pastor Ashrick. And I just want to uplift him in a special way right now. Please give him the strength, the energy, and um, the clarity of mind as he brings, brings us the important message this evening. And I just want to praise you and thank you for um, bringing up a um, very special speaker, servant like Pastor Ashrick, and for his dedication and ministry to the young people. And I also want to um, pray for the interpreters tonight um, mm -hmm. as they have a very, very important task as well to um, interpret his message, your message, um, in several different languages. And I, and I just ask that you give them the speed and the right words, um, right words to say. I just want to thank you so much for your blessing, for your love, and for always um, embracing us with your mercy and grace. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. Thank you, Grace. All right, good evening, everyone. It's nice to be here at GYC. Are you having a good experience? Are you, are you having a good experience? Yes. You seem a little subdued for allegedly having had a good experience. I'm having a great experience. I've really enjoyed the messages so far, and the food has been good too, which is always an upside. I want to thank uh, GYC and GYC Europe, the organizers, for uh, inviting me to be here and the various divisions and unions that have participated. It's awesome to be here. And uh, I don't want to spend really too much time thanking people. I want to get right into scripture. Amen. So uh, I'm just going to begin with a word of prayer and we're going to dive in. Why don't we stand for prayer together? <clears throat> Father in heaven, we stand before you now in prayer, not as a confession of strength or of worthiness, but as an admission of weakness and need. Father, we are your children. We come from different lands and different places. Many of us speak different languages, different backgrounds, different circumstances. But Father, you know every one of us, the very hairs of our head are numbered. You know us as if we were the only person ever. You know us intimately, you know us authentically and truly. And so Father, we stand before you now as your children. We say with John the Apostle, behold what manner of love the Father has bestowed upon us that we should be called the sons and daughters of God. Tonight, Father, as, as we open Scripture, we would pray and would ask that you would send your Spirit not just into this hall, but into the hearts of the people here. Give us a picture, give us a glimpse, give us a sense of heaven's nearness. We are in the world but help us not to be of the world. We are surrounded by sensualism and secularism. Father, tonight may we have a sense that heaven is very near and that Jesus, by his spirit, is so near so as to be inside of us. Bless us now as we open scripture. May you open us, is our prayer in Jesus' name. Let everyone say, amen. All right, you may be seated. I'd like to begin with uh, just a very simple sort of a game, I guess you could call it, uh, kind of a word association, and it's going to be hard for me to interact with you, but maybe some of you right here, especially in the front, can speak up really loud. 
Um, I want you to get a mental picture right now of an airport. Okay, a mental picture of what, everyone? An airport. And when I say the word airport, I want you to just say to me, a few of you, what comes to your mind? When I say airport, somebody raise their hand. What's the first thing that comes to your mind? Airport. Okay, plane. There's the obvious one. Somebody else. What was that? Okay, that's good. Somebody else. Security, somebody says. That's a very good one. Okay, so airport. Somebody else. Flights. Passengers. Cargo. Stewardess. Okay, very good. Okay, let's try this one. You're getting the idea. Your brain is warmed up now. You're getting the idea. We're doing an association. Now I'm going to give you another one. The book of Acts. The biblical book of Acts. Matthew, Mark, Luke, John, Acts. When I say the biblical book of Acts... What associations, what words, what pictures, what stories come to your mind? Somebody, raise your hand. Go ahead, nice and loud. Okay, the day of Pentecost, the Holy Spirit. Somebody else, nice and loud. The outpouring of the Spirit, what? The Apostle Paul. Okay, more. I'm looking for the book of Acts. What comes to your mind? Nice and loud. The, the what? Okay, very good. Paul and his, and his ministry. Somebody else. What is that? Speaking in tongues. Okay. I heard somebody say healings. Okay, right there, please. Nice and loud. Unity of the Christians. Louder again. The conversion of Saul. Okay, very good. Anybody else? The stoning of Stephen. Conversion of the Gentiles. Okay, great. Holy Spirit. I heard that one again. Excellent. I'm, I'm so glad that you have fallen headlong into the trap that I have laid for you. You've done a good job of it. I want to thank you for that. Our presentation tonight is titled The Other Side of Acts. The Other Side of Acts. Now, I don't know if you have this saying here in Europe or in your various countries, but in the United States we have a saying... And the saying is, the other side of the tracks. Has anyone here ever heard that saying before? The other side of the tracks. Okay, the tracks are the train tracks that would often run through town. And uh, there was often a good side of town and a bad side of town. And uh, uh, the wealthy people, the affluent people, the educated people, so to speak, tended to live on one side of the tracks. And they would talk about the people from the other side of the tracks, who tended to not be of the same social sphere or social spectrum, etc., and when we think of the biblical book of Acts, um, more often than not, we have the same kind of picture in our mind that you have just communicated to me in your word association. And if we had more time, um, you would probably say things like the healing of the man at, uh, in Acts chapter 3 at the temple gate. You would talk about um, the gospel being poured out, uh, the spirit rather being poured out in Acts chapter 19. You would have all of these things and typically the responses that you would give would be positive. Would be what everyone? Positive. If I ask you about the book of Acts, everything that you said here, and somebody might have said something negative, perhaps the stoning of Stephen could qualify... But for the most part, when I ask you for word associations about the book of Acts, you're saying positive things. You're saying the conversion of Saul, the outpouring of the Holy Spirit, unity in the church, the healing of people, all of these really, really positive things. What I want to do this evening is go to the other side of the tracks. There is a book of Acts that many of us have read, um, we have skipped over elements that present a far more human side. A far more, what word did I say, everyone? A far more human side. We often remember the highlights. We remember the day of Pentecost. We remember the baptism of the 3,000. We remember the healing. We remember the outpouring of the Holy Spirit. But what I want to do tonight is take you through a tour of the book of Acts, the other side of Acts. And it will paint a picture that I think you will find simultaneously surprising and absolutely encouraging. Now, what we sometimes do when we read the book of Acts, as I've just illustrated here, is we look at the book of Acts, not with our glasses, such as I'm wearing here, my glasses, but we often read the Bible and the book of Acts with sunglasses on. 
Now, I want to thank my good friend Adam Ramden, the director of Peace, for lending me his sunglasses. Make sure you get a good close-up view of these. Um, when we come to the book of Acts, and when we come to the Bible in general, but especially the book of Acts, we tend to take a very idealistic view. Wait, make sure you get the picture, okay? There it is. We tend to take a very idealistic view, a view in which we remember all of the mountaintops, we remember all of the positive things, but the valleys and the humanity of the book of Acts is missing. And so what I want to do this evening is take off our sunglasses that we often read the book of Acts with, and I want to put on just our ordinary glasses. We're going to read it not just as a divine document that tells all of these high points, but we're going to read those other passages that sometimes escape our notice. So we're in Acts chapter 1. Join me there if you would, Acts chapter 1. Go with me to Acts and the first chapter. We've taken our sunglasses off. We're going to put our real glasses on. And we're going to begin right in Acts chapter 1. Right in Acts chapter 1. Now, it's very interesting that of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, many scholars would say, many students of Scripture would say, that Luke presents Jesus as the most human. Of course, all of the Gospel writers present Jesus as a human being. But, but Luke is very in tune with the humanity of Jesus. Luke, for example, is the only uh, Gospel writer that tells us anything particularly about Jesus' childhood. Uh, Luke contains the story, Luke chapter 2, of Jesus going to the temple at the age of 12. Luke, as a physician, took a very human view of Jesus, also certainly a divine view. But it's very appropriate for us that this same Luke that wrote the Gospel of Luke also wrote the book of Acts. And the picture that is painted by Luke is, yes, a positive picture, yes, a beautiful picture, yes, a spirit-filled picture. But as we're going to see tonight, as we go to the other side of Acts... It's also a very human picture. And so we're going to go right to Acts chapter 1. And in verse 6, just as Jesus is ready to ascend, he has spent time with the disciples. He has um, spent 40 days with them. And he is preparing to ascend to go to heaven. The disciples have a burning question on their hearts, a burning question on their minds. They just, they can't wait to ask this question. It's the question that they've been wondering about since the very first day that they followed Jesus. When by the, the shore there of the Sea of Galilee, Jesus had said, follow me and I will make you fishers of men. Matthew, or excuse me, uh, uh, James and John and Peter, Andrew, they believed that Jesus was the Messiah. They believed that. And because they were involved in the culture and they were surrounded by the culture of first century Judaism, they had a particular perspective of what following the Messiah would be. And they took a very earthly um, view of the kingdom and of the kind of kingdom that Jesus would introduce. And over and over again, we find these sort of glimpses of the earthliness of the disciples' understanding of the kingdom. For example, on one occasion, the disciples came to Jesus and they said, Jesus, when you come into your kingdom, can I sit on the right and my brother sit on the left? They took a very earthly, very political, very governmental view of the Messiah as establishing an earthly, almost militaristic kingdom over and above the other nations, and particularly Rome. And yet even here, after the crucifixion, after the resurrection of Jesus, the disciples have a question that is just burning in their hearts. And I want you to hear this question, Acts chapter 1, verse 6. They say to Jesus, Lord, will you at this time restore, what does your Bible say? The kingdom to Israel. Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? It's a fascinating thing to know that even though the disciples have spent three and a half years with Jesus, even though they have witnessed his unanticipated crucifixion, they have seen his resurrection, they've spent 40 days with him post-resurrection, the question that is on the tip of their tongues that, that they're just burning to have the answer to is, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? Jesus responds and basically says, it's not for you to know the times of the seasons which the Father has put in his power, but you will receive power after the Holy Spirit has come upon you. Go to Jerusalem and wait there for the promise of the Father. Now here's the point. Here we have the burgeoning new church, God's church. The church that God is going to pour out his Holy Spirit on 
but they still have a major misunderstanding of the most basic thing that Jesus was talking about, namely the kingdom of heaven. They have spent three years with Jesus. Jesus has told them all kinds of things about the kingdom of heaven. The kingdom of heaven is like a mustard seed. The kingdom of heaven is like a man who found a treasure in a field. The kingdom of heaven is all of these things. And he, even here, after the resurrection, after the, the crucifixion, the question that is just burning that they have to have an answer to is, will you at this time restore, and in their mind what they're asking is, the earthly kingdom to Israel? Here's the point. God's church, even at the outset, had a major misunderstanding of the most basic thing that Jesus was talking about. The church was out of step with God. The church was out of step with God. Don't miss that. We go to Acts chapter 2. Now, many of you will be familiar with Acts chapter 2. In Acts chapter 2, things are going great. Peter preaches on the day of Pentecost. 3,000 people are baptized. It's absolutely awesome. This is the view that we often have of the book of Acts. When we have our, when we have our sunglasses on, we remember Acts chapter 2. They were all in one accord, in one place. The Holy Spirit was poured out. We remember Acts chapter 3 as well. Acts chapter 3, Peter goes there to the gate of the temple and the man puts out his hand and says, do you have any alms for the poor? And Peter responds and says, silver and gold I do not have, but what I do have I give you in the name of Jesus Christ of Nazareth. What does he say? Rise up and... Well, we remember that story. We even remember Acts chapter 4. We remember so many things. In fact, go with me to Acts chapter 4. And notice as Acts chapter 4 draws to a close, this is the arrest of Peter. He's put into prison. He's, he and John are both let out of prison. An angel intercedes miraculously. And as Acts chapter 4 comes to a close, I'm going to pick it up in verse 32. Acts chapter 4 verse 32. Notice the beautiful, idealistic, communal picture that is here communicated. It says, now the multitude of those who believed were all of one heart and one soul. Neither did anyone say that any of the things that he possessed was his own, but they had how many things in common? They had all things in common. That's actually the root word of the, that's the root word of the word community. The word community has as its etymological origin, common. In a community, you have things in common. And here, speaking of the early church, it says that they had everything in common. So much so, look at verse 33, it says that with great power the apostles gave witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon them all. What a beautiful picture. Nor was there anyone among them who lacked, for all who were possessors of lands or houses sold them and brought the proceeds of the things that were sold and laid them at the apostles' feet and they distributed to each one as they had need. And Joseph, who was also named Barnabas by the apostles, which is translated son of encouragement, a Levite of the country of Cyprus, having land, he sold it and he brought the money and he laid it at the apostles' feet. What a beautiful picture. In Acts chapter 1, we begin with a little bit of a speed bump, a little bit of a hiccup, when the disciples still don't understand the nature of the kingdom. And they say, will you at this time restore the kingdom? Jesus says, go to Jerusalem and wait. Jerusalem, in Acts chapter 2, Holy Spirit is poured out. Acts chapter 3, the man is healed. Acts chapter 4, they're preaching with power. They're thrown into prison. And then they come out of prison. And Luke paints this glorious, idyllic, and accurate picture that everybody had so much in common that they would sell things. They would sell their goods and their wares and their lands. And they would come and lay them at the apostles' feet and say, distribute this as you see best. Everything in common. They had Christ in common. They had community in common. At this point, they still had their Jewish heritage in common. Um, and they even had their finances and their money in common. A beautiful, happy, idyllic picture. And we remember this. When I ask you to give the word association for the book of Acts, these are the kinds of things you said. You said unity, the outpouring of the Spirit, 3,000 baptized. And this is the view. This is the sunglasses view of the book of Acts. But a very interesting thing happens in Acts chapter 5. In Acts chapter 5, right at the very beginning, the first word of Acts chapter 5 is what? Verse 1. You tell me what the word is. Yeah, the word is but. The word but tells us that for a moment at least, we're going to have to take our sunglasses off. Everything was good and everything was happy and everybody was selling their various possessions and lands. And there's this beautiful idyllic picture presented. And then Acts chapter 5 says, but, but, a certain man, what was his name everyone? A certain man named Ananias 
with Sapphira, his wife, sold a possession. And he kept back part of the proceeds, his wife being aware of it. And brought a certain part and laid it at the apostles' feet. But Peter said to Ananias, Why has the Holy Spirit filled your hearts to lie to the, or pardon me, why has Satan filled your hearts to lie to the Holy Spirit and keep back part of the price of the land for yourself? While it remained, it was your own. And after it was sold, was it not in your own control? Was it not in your own control? Why have you conceived this thing in your heart? You have not lied to men, but to God. Then Ananias, hearing these words, fell down and breathed his last, so great fear came upon all those who heard these things. And a young, young man arose and wrapped him and carried him out and buried him. Now it was about three hours later when his wife came in, not knowing what had happened, and Peter said to her, tell me whether you sold the land for so much. And she said, yeah, that's right, we sold it for about that much. Then Peter said to her, how is it that you have agreed together to test the Spirit of the Lord? Look, the feet of those who buried your husband are at the door, and they will carry you out. Then immediately she fell down at his feet and breathed her last. And the young men came in, found her dead, and carrying her out, buried her by her husband. So great fear came upon all the church and upon those who heard these things. Okay, so now we have a hiccup. We have a hiccup right in the middle of the, of the beginning of the book of Acts. Everything is smooth sailing except for the little speed bump in Acts chapter 1 where the disciples still misunderstand the nature of the kingdom. But Acts 2, everything is great. Acts 3, everything is great. Acts 4, everything is beautiful, idyllic, glorious. In Acts chapter 5, within the church... Okay, what words did I say right there? What is that phrase? Within the church. I want you to say that with me. Within the church, there is brazen, bold hypocrisy. The hypocrisy is so brazen and is so bold that God himself steps in to mitigate the problem. God steps in. God comes down and supernaturally relieves both Ananias and Sapphira of their lives. God could see that like a spreading cancer or a spreading disease, if this hypocrisy was not checked, it would open the floodgates for others who were disingenuous, inauthentic, and hypocritical to begin to come into the church. And so God steps in, supernaturally deals with this hypocritical situation. But here's the point. Ananias and Sapphira were church members who were in the church who were doing at least something right. I mean, they sold the possession, whatever the possession was, some land, and they brought at least some of it to the disciples' feet. These looked like good church members. To, to the external eye, man looks on the outward appearance, but God looks on the heart. To the external eye, when Ananias, Ananias and Sapphira were suddenly struck dead, the Bible says that great fear came upon the churches. Now everyone was suddenly searching their own hearts for any residual hypocrisy. Maybe I'm inauthentic. Maybe I'm disingenuous. And it was a bit of a wake-up call. It was a bit of a check on the church. Now, Acts chapter 5 shows us that there was hypocrisy in the church. So brazen, so bold, and so forthright that God himself had to step in and deal with it. Come with me to Acts chapter 6. Acts chapter 6. Verse 1. We'll leave our sunglasses off for the moment. We're going to need our sunglasses off for this verse. Now in those days when the number of the disciples was multiplying, so the church is growing very fast. Okay. Now we tend to think of that as a positive thing and it usually is. But I remind you that part of the problem with a cancer is that it grows too fast. Fast growth is not always a positive thing. In this case, it was largely a positive thing. But every time we have large growth and thousands or tens of thousands coming in with the genuine, with the converted, with the real, there are always less genuine, less converted, and less authentic that are coming in with them. And here it's very interesting. It says the church was growing very rapidly. Watch what happens as the church begins to grow very rapidly. There arose a complaint against the Hebrews by the Hellenists because their widows were neglected in the daily ministration. Okay, let's paint the picture. In first century Jerusalem, first century Palestine, the Jews were divided. You could have divided the Jewish population up into two halves, just as this auditorium is divided up into two halves here, two sides. 
On one side were what were called the Palestinian Jews. Okay? Palestine was the name that the Romans gave to the area that we refer to now as Jerusalem and the Middle East and all of that, that area. So the Palestinian Jews were those Jews who, for the most part, remained geographically in Palestine. When the various persecutions came or the, the dispersions came, whether it was through Babylon or Medo-Persia or Greece, especially after the exile, okay, the Babylonian exile, the Palestinian Jews were those who said, this is our land, we're staying here, and we're not leaving under any circumstances. It's our land. That same spirit is still very much alive today in the Zionism of modernity. Um, but there were other Jews who were very much Jewish in their genealogy, very much Jewish in their culture, but they had moved to other places, to the north of Africa, into Asia Minor, up into what we would call Southern Europe. They had, they had been dispersed, what's called the diaspora. And uh, when they had been dispersed, they would remain away from Palestine for perhaps several generations, two or three or more. But Many Jews, especially the most devout, they would return to Palestine for the pilgrim feasts. They would come back three times a year if possible, but they couldn't always do that. And often when they would return to Palestine, they would find circumstances better to, uh, ju just better, just to their liking, and they would stay. They would remain in Palestine. The problem was, is that the Palestinian Jews, those who had remained, they tended to look down on the Hellenists who had left for a generation or two or three or more. They tended to take a, a low view and they regarded them as inferior Jews and in some cases not really Jews at all. And uh, they were so um, patriotic in their Jewishness and in their theological perspective that they actually regarded these other Jews as Greeks, as Gentiles, in some cases as Gentiles. Because what had happened was... These Hellenistic Jews, they had traveled, you know, to a place where they learned to eat the local food and speak the local language and listen to the local music. And now when they returned back, they had, at least in the mind of the Palestinian Jews, they had left behind some of their unique Jewishness. And so there was this divide between the Hellenistic Jews, the Greek-speaking Jews, and the Palestinian Jews. Okay? Now here's an interesting thing. When Jesus begins to preach, and when the disciples begin to preach, because Palestine, the Jewish population was divided into those two major segments, Palestinian Jews were being converted, giving their hearts to Jesus as the Messiah, believing that he was the Messiah, and Hellenistic Jews were also coming in. But here's something that happens. According to Acts chapter 6, verse 1, that division and that pride and that pettiness followed them into the church. The divisions that they had before followed them in. And so that sharp division between the Palestinian and the Hellenist. And, and Luke tells us that it, it, in this particular case, there was a, di a dispute. And the Hellenists said, hey, this isn't fair. Our widows are not receiving sufficient compensation. They are not receiving the same level of remuneration that the Palestinian Jews are receiving. They actually have a super, uh, a, a suspicious view of church leadership. They are prejudiced, they are prideful, they are petty, and they are, they are suspicious. Now, does that sound anything like your church? Do you find in your local church, in your conference, that there is sometimes pettiness, yes or no? Is there sometimes pride? Is there sometimes prejudice? Is there sometimes suspicion of church leadership? Absolutely. And it was in the church. You see, beloved, here in, in, in Acts chapter 6, we get a very fascinating little insight to the fact that even though people were giving their hearts to Jesus and believing in him as the Messiah, when they came into the church, they brought their baggage with them. In this case, their cultural, social, theological baggage. Is it possible... That even here in the global village that earth has become, that we could retain some of those prejudices even in the Seventh-day Adventist church. Is that possible? So that we could actually see somebody as a black Seventh-day Adventist versus just a Seventh-day Adventist. Or we could see them as a Caribbean Seventh-day Adventist versus just a Seventh-day Adventist. Or we could see them as a white Seventh-day Adventist versus just a Seventh-day Adventist. Is it possible that those prejudices and that pettiness could follow us into the church? Is that possible? Yes or no? 
Not only is it possible in some cases, for example, in my home division, the North American division, that division, and I'm speaking now of the divide, that divide has been institutionalized. And we have white churches and then we have black churches. Divisions right down the middle of the church. So some people are over there and some people are over there. And we think, we think, oh, this is a good thing. I, I, I want to go on record here as saying that I don't think God views it as a good thing. In fact, I'm sure he does not view it as a good thing. But here's the point. In Acts chapter 5, we see outright hypocrisy in the church. Acts chapter 6, we see pride, we see pettiness, we see suspicion, and we see prejudice in the church. In the church, God's church. That probably sounds a little bit like your church. You see, sometimes what happens to us is we, and follow this point very carefully... We read the book of Acts with our sunglasses on, and then we put on our regular glasses to look at our own church, and we think, oh, there's such a difference. Oh, oh, that we could have the apostolic church. Oh, that we could have that primitive Christianity. Oh, that we could be filled with the Spirit, because back then, everything was awesome. Everybody loved one another, and there were no problems, and there was no pettiness, and there was no pride, and there was no prejudice, and there was no hypocrisy. And then we look at our church today, and we say, but in my church, my church is dead. My church is worldly. My church is secular. My church doesn't... Beloved, you need to read the book of Acts again. When you read the book of Acts, you need to take your sunglasses off and read what Luke actually said. Are there positive things in the book of Acts? Of course there are. Were there 3,000 baptized? Yes. Were there healings? Yes. Were there, was there unity? Yes. Was the Spirit outpoured? Yes, 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 yes. But Luke also paints a very human picture. And here's the point. It's still God's church. The Spirit was still working. Despite their pettiness, despite their pride, despite their prejudice and su suspicion. So Acts chapter 6. In Acts chapter 7, we find the experience of the stoning of Stephen. We'll move through that. Acts 8 and 9 is the conversion of Saul. We'll move through that. Join me in Acts chapter 10. Acts chapter 10, Peter has a vision. Who has a vision, everyone? Peter has a vision, and the Bible says he went up on the rooftop to pray and that he was hungry. And uh, he was so hungry that God gave him a vision that had to do with hunger. And in this particular vision, Peter kneels down and he sees a sheet and all kinds of things passing through the sheet. He sees creeping things and crawling things and he hears a voice from heaven that says, Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Peter protests. I've never eaten anything common or unclean. He hears the, the voice again. Rise, Peter, kill and eat. Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. As a Jew, he's totally confused. Third time, rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he protests, Lord, I've never eaten anything common or unclean. And then a voice comes to Peter and the voice says, hey, Peter, listen up, listen up. There are men that are seeking you. They are at the door. Don't doubt anything. Go with them. So Peter rises from his vision that he doesn't understand. And he looks down and there are two individuals that are inquiring, is there a man named Peter here? Yes, he's upstairs. So Peter comes down and he recognizes immediately these two individuals are Gentiles. Okay, they're, what did I say, everyone? They're Gentiles. And they say, Peter, would you please come with us? Now, Peter's Jewish prejudices would normally prevent him from doing that. He, if, if he hadn't received this vision and this assurance from, from the Spirit, he would not have gone. But, but he's still puzzled about this vision, confused about rise, Peter, kill and eat. And he's troubled about this impression by, G, by the Spirit to go with these Gentiles, so he goes along. When he begins to make his way on the second day of the journey, they come near to the place where a man named Cornelius comes out and does the very thing that Peter would be terrified of. He falls down at Peter's feet, and Peter's like, whoa, 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 stand up, man, I'm just a man. Stand up, don't do that. That's not, a, that's not an appropriate posture. Cornelius then takes Peter by the hand and brings him into a large room and the Bible says that there were, Peter had gathered his family and his friends there. Let's just read this. It says, um, verse 24 of Acts chapter 10. And the following day they entered Caesarea. Now Cornelius was waiting for them, and he had called together his relatives and close friends. As Peter was coming in, Cornelius met him, fell down at his feet, and worshipped him. But Peter said, stand up, I myself am also a man. 
And as he talked with them, he went in and found many who had come together. Now look at what Peter says here, verse 28. Then Peter, addressing this company of Gentiles, we don't know how many it was, we'll say it was a hundred. A hundred Gentiles. You know how it is unlawful for me, unlawful for me, a Jewish man, to keep company with or to go to one of another nation. But God has shown me that I should not call any... What does your Bible say? God has not sh shown me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And suddenly, Peter's vision comes to him. When the sheet had come down, rise, Peter, kill and eat. It wasn't about, you know, bat sandwiches and iguana soup. He realizes in this moment, that vision was about people. God has showed me that I should not call any man common or unclean. And Peter preaches the gospel to them. Can you say amen? Peter preaches the gospel to the Gentiles and just as you would expect, just as you would anticipate, the spirit is poured out. Can you say amen? Hallelujah. And the spirit is poured out to such a degree and to such an extent that the Gentiles begin to speak in other languages just as the disciples had back in Acts chapter 2. Peter says, since the spirit is poured out upon them, what could prevent them from being baptized? And Peter, a Jewish man who just two or three days earlier would have never consented to such a thing, baptizes those Gentiles because he saw that the Spirit was doing the same thing, baptizing with himself. And so Peter baptizes the Gentiles. Now here's the point. Peter is, sim is, remains out of tune with what God is doing. He's slow to get the big picture. I mean, this is Peter. This is Peter the leader. This is, this is Peter, the, 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 the disciple of Jesus, the one who was always at the forefront. And here, he's very slow to discern the moving of God. Very slow. Do you ever find that your frustration with your conference leaders or your church leaders or your pastors? Do you, ever, do you ever find yourself frustrated with the church leadership that they seem to not be getting it? Yes or no? I do. I could stand up here for an hour and talk to you about my personal frustrations with various levels of church governance and things that I think they're not getting it. They're missing the picture. They're missing the boat. But here's an interesting thing. I see that right in the book of Acts. Where God's own church leadership is just a step behind what the Spirit is doing. Not always, but, but often enough to give us hope. They're not always walking right with the Spirit. Right where the Spirit goes, they go. And here goes the Spirit, and they're just right beside Him, just like this. No, sometimes the Spirit's a little ahead, and they're just slightly behind. Beloved, that should give you great encouragement when you look at times at the at the local church situation or the conference situation or the union situation or the division situation or even the general conference situation, if the church appears just a step behind what the Spirit is doing, it doesn't mean it's not God's church. Amen. Now, Peter, you can just imagine as he's participating in this first ever Gentile baptismal service, he says to them, hey, look, can we keep this just between us? Can you not... Can, we, can this be between us? Because when we get to Acts chapter 11, join me there, Acts chapter 11. We get to Acts chapter 11, the Bible says, Now the apostles and brethren who were in Judea heard that the Gentiles had also received the word of God. So, so the rumor has gotten out. And when Peter came to Jerusalem, those who were of the circumcision contended with him saying, look at this. You went into uncircumcised men and you ate with them. <laughs> and you, I could just imagine that Peter's thinking, I hope that's all they know, you know? <laughs> hey, we heard a rumor that you went out to eat with Gentiles. And he's thinking, wait till they hear the rest of the story. <laughs> yeah, I went out to eat with them and I preached to them and I baptized them. And... Uh, so, so Peter begins to recount. In Acts chapter 11, he recounts the story for them. And when they hear the recounting, they're even a little slow. What? And it takes them a moment because just like Peter, they're just a step behind the Spirit. They're just a step behind the Spirit. They're just a step behind the Spirit. But then they finally get it. The penny drops, so to speak. And, and they, they realize that God has given repentance to the Gentiles. Can you say Amen. 
Now this, in Luke's account, is perfectly timed with the conversion of Saul. Acts 8 and 9. Saul has just been converted, and if you and I were going to assign Saul, now Paul, to some work, just based on his resume, would you have sent Paul to the Jews or to the Gentiles? You'd send him to the Jews, of course, because he was a Jew. Not only a Jew, he was educated under Gamaliel. I mean, he was, he was a Jew's Jew. So you would think, oh, this is the guy. He'll go to the Jews. But God had a different plan because God's ways are not our ways. He works in mysterious and wonderful ways. God takes this Jewish Jew, exceedingly Jewish Jew, and he sends him to the Gentiles. And in Luke's account of the book of Acts, these two things, Saul's conversion and Peter's vision in Acts 10, they just coalesce into this glorious and beautiful thing. Now, also stay in Acts chapter 11. Notice this. Acts chapter 11 has a pivotal text here. It's in verses 19 and 20. In fact, in many ways... This is sort of the, the teeter-totter text. I don't know if you know what a, you know what a teeter-totter is? A seesaw? The, the kids play on? Do you have those? All right, forget I said that. Basically, here's what's happening. Up to this point in Acts, we've been dealing primarily with a Jerusalem-based ministry and Peter and the rest of the disciples. But from this point forward, it's almost exclusively Paul. And notice it, Acts chapter 11, verses 19 and 20. Now, those who were scattered after the persecution, that was the persecution because of Stephen's stoning, that arose over Stephen, traveled as far as Phoenicia, Cyprus, and Antioch, preaching the word, but, but to no one but the Jews only. So there was still this, the word is parochialism. Parochialism, an, ins, an insularity, only us. They were preaching just to the Jews, okay? But look at verse 20, interesting. But some of them were men from Cyprus and Cyrene who, when they had come to Antioch, spoke to the Greeks, preaching the Lord Jesus. So here's this pivotal verse. The, 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 the divide in the book of Acts is between Acts chapter 11, verse 19 and verse 20, where this is largely for the Jews and this is largely for the Gentiles. And most of the rest of the book of Acts are Paul's three missionary journeys, four if you count his journey to Rome. Paul begins to, now after his conversion, Paul begins to move through Asia Minor. And then he goes back through Asia Minor. And then he goes through again on a slightly different route. You see the gospel going to the Gentiles. Now notice there's persecution. Acts chapter 11 also tells us there was famine. So there was pressure from the outside, persecution and famine, at least in Jerusalem. And there was also from the inside, just to remind us, Acts chapter 1 the disciples were still basically misunderstanding the kingdom of God. Acts chapter 5, open hypocrisy. Acts chapter 6, pride, prejudice, pettiness, and suspicion. Acts chapter 10, Peter is just a step behind the Holy Spirit, just a step behind the Holy Spirit. But when we get to the conversion of Saul, this is where things really start to go wild. Because in Acts 13 and 14, it's basically Paul preaching to the Gentiles on his first missionary journey. Who's he preaching to, everyone? Gentiles. Now watch this. Paul's evangelism to the Gentiles is wildly successful, especially compared to the success that the church was having with the Palestinian Jews. Of the three groups, Palestinian Jews, Hellenistic Jews, and Gentiles, the church was growing the fastest, would grow the fastest among the Gentiles, second fastest among the Hellenistic Jews, and slowest among the Palestinian Jews. This has huge implications that we're going to talk about tomorrow night. But here's the point. As Paul is beginning to travel and baptize Gentiles, the church is beginning to grow now even more than it was already growing before exponentially. But this is making some people really uncomfortable. Paul is mingling with, he's spending time with, he's eating with, he's talking with Gentile peoples. In fact, Paul... And on one occasion would say that his whole ministry was based around those that were under the law, I act under the law. Those that are without the law, namely the Gentiles, I act as without the law. To the Greek, I become a Greek. To the Jew, I become a Jew. Paul's whole ministry was assimilation and adaptation for the purpose of bringing salvation. But this made the Jews very uncomfortable, especially the Palestinian Jews, because they viewed their patriotism and their insularity as people coming to them. We're not going to change our Jewishness. This is who we are. 
pharisaical, insular, isolated. This is who we are and you will come to us and you will become a Jew. But Paul, radical, revolutionary, has thrown off many of the shackles of of rabbinical Judaism and cultural Judaism and he is now associating freely and joyously with Gentile peoples and he's bringing the message to them. Well, the problem is, is that he's telling them they don't have to be circumcised in order to become members of God's community of faith. So look at this, Acts chapter 15. When we get to Acts chapter 15, we have a major conflict, theological conflict, missiological conflict, ecclesiastical conflict. We have a major conflict in Acts chapter 15. Verse 1. Certain men came down from Judea and taught the brethren, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. So they believed in Jesus. They said it's Jesus plus circumcision. That equals salvation. Look at this, verse 2. Therefore, when Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and dispute with them. Okay, no small dissension and dispute. That is another way of saying they had a total blow up. I mean, they just had a knockdown, drag out controversy, a fight. Paul had no small dissension and dispute with them. They were determined that Paul and Barnabas and certain of the others should go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So being sent on their way to the church, they passed through Phoenicia and Samaria, describing the conversion of the Gentiles, and they caused great joy to all of the brethren. So here's what happens. Paul comes with the circumcision, and they present their case to the church, to James and Peter and the rest of the disciples, the brethren. And Paul basically says, man, we've been preaching like crazy, we've been pouring our heart out, and there are many conversions, and we're telling the Gentiles they don't have to be circumcised. The circumcision are saying, no, 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 you're setting aside Jewishness. Jesus was a Jewish Messiah. The Bible was written by Jewish individuals. You yourself are a Jew, Paul, and there's this major controversy. Now, you can understand why Paul would want to diminish the significance of circumcision, not only for theological reasons, but just for evangelistic reasons. Can you imagine preaching to a bunch of Gentiles? And uh, you're like, hey... You guys can be saved. You have to put your faith in Jesus. You have to trust in God's Messiah. The life that he lived is the life that you have not lived. The death that he died was the death you deserved. You can receive eternal life if you put your faith in God's Messiah. Just believe and you can be saved. And people are like, yes, yes, I want to be saved. And people are coming. They're coming forward. They're making a decision by the hundreds and in some cases perhaps even the thousands. And then can you imagine if Paul, now he had to say, there's just one more thing, just a little thing. Um, could I talk to the fellas? <laughs> Brings the fellas into the side room and says, you know, guys, I'm so glad you put your faith in Jesus. Can you imagine when Mark Finley makes an altar call? Everybody comes forward. He says, there's just one more thing. Just step over here. Paul did not want to, I mean, because circumcision was a very Jewish thing. And Paul, both theologically and evangelistically, he saw circumcision as the sign of the old covenant and baptism as the sign of the new covenant. So Paul does not, he can see how this will slow the evangelistic growth among the Gentiles. And so Paul is emphatic. And there's this controversy. Question. Are there sometimes theological ecclesiastical and evangelistic controversies in the Seventh-day Adventist church? Yes or no? But it's still God's church. And that's the point. The church was wrestling, and I want to say something here for those of you that get this. I, I hope all of you get it, but I'm sure some of you may not. But those of you that get this, please listen to me very carefully. The church was wrestling with the issue of contextualization. How do we take the message and make it applicable to society? How do we do it? What do we keep? What do we let go? What's important? What's not important? What's negotiable? What's non-negotiable? The early church wrestled with the issue of contextualizing the gospel. Question for those of you living here in Europe. Do you struggle in Europe contextualizing the gospel, yes or no? Does it sometimes create controversies and divisions and even heated opinions about what is appropriate and what is not appropriate, yes or no? Oh, Lord have mercy. Of course. What we need to do is take a deep breath. Can you say amen? 
and realize that these same kind of controversies were in the early church. And Paul sets forth his case, and the Judaizers set forth their case, and the church comes down on the side of Paul, and they write a letter. And they say, you know what? There's four things that the Gentiles have to do. Don't eat things strangled, don't eat blood, abstain from sexual immorality, and from idols. You do those four things, you do not have to be circumcised. And you can just imagine Paul going, yes. The point is this. I sometimes hear people say, oh, the Adventist church, oh, the Adventist church, we've got to get our doctrine figured out. We're not unified on doctrine. We need more unity. We need unity on women's ordination. We need unity on the nature of Christ. We need unity on music. We need unity on all of these things. And the Spirit cannot be poured out until there is complete unity. That is not true. The early church, the apostolic church, the book of Acts church had divisions, had dissensions, had disputes, and the Spirit was still poured out because the church was not perfect, but they were trusting in a perfect Savior. Amen. See, when we read the book of Acts, we put these glasses on. We say, oh man, it was awesome. Everybody loved one another. Everybody got along. There were no problems. There were no disputes. There were no dissensions. I mean, it was awesome. And then we put on our glasses for our modern church and we say, oh, look at, look at the disputes. Look at the theological issues. Look at the pride. Look at the pettiness. Look, ah! And we long for the good old days. Let me tell you something. The good old days were very good, but they were also very human, just like today. Stay in Acts chapter 15 and look at this one. You might be thinking, oh, well, that was just theological. It was just theological, David. Look at Acts chapter 15, verse 36. Then after some days, Paul said to Barnabas... Let us now go back and visit our brethren in every city where we have preached the word of the Lord. And let's see how they're doing. You get the feeling that Paul was just, he was just like, just hyper. Hey, let's do that again. Let's, let's go back. You know, just constant energy. And hey, we, let's, let's go on another perilous, life-endangering journey for Jesus. Right? And Barnabas, he was like, yeah, let's do it. But watch. Let us now go back to verse 37. Now Barnabas says, hey, good idea. I'll go get John Mark. I'll go get John Mark. Watch this, verse 37. Now Barnabas was determined to take with them John called Mark. But Paul insisted that they should not take with them the one who had departed from them in Pamphylia and who had not gone with them to the work. Then the contention, the dispute, the argument, the, the debate... The contention became so sharp, sharp, so sharp that they parted from one another. And Barnabas took Mark and sailed to Cyprus. And Paul sailed, uh, da, 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 but Paul chose Silas and departed being commanded by, the brethren of, uh, commanded by the brethren to the grace of God. Here's what happens. Here's Paul and he's having a huge dispute with Barnabas. And Barnabas says, John Mark is coming with us. And Paul says, he's not coming. He abandoned us in Asia Minor. And then Barnabas says, no, he is coming. And, and Paul says, maybe I wasn't clear. He's not coming. And at some point, it would have degenerated into a kind of adolescent argument where, where one of them would have said, well, if he's going, I'm not going. Oh, you want to take John Mark? You can go by yourself. And then the other one would have said, okay, fine. You just go by yourself. I'll just go with John Mark. There was personality conflict in the early church, even between the godliest of leaders. I want to say that again. There was personality conflict in the early church, even between the godliest of leaders, namely Paul and Barnabas. It wasn't just theological. It wasn't just pride and prejudice and divisions between the Palestinians and the Hellenists. This was a personal argument between two individuals, both at fault. Question, in your church, in your conference, in your union, in your division, are there ever just petty adolescent, childish arguments that come up, yes or no? Yeah, but what you do, you do what I'm tempted to do. You think, oh, we're so far. The Spirit could never be poured out upon us because we're arguing like children. But we go read the book of Acts and we read right over that part. We think, oh, everything was awesome in the book of Acts. But when we look at our own church, oh, no, 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 very different. You see, friends, not only in Acts chapter 1 was Peter 
and the rest of the apostles misunderstanding the kingdom of heaven. In Acts chapter 5, there was open hypocrisy. In Acts chapter 6, there's pride, prejudice, pettiness, and suspicion. In Acts chapter 10, Peter is just a step behind what the Holy Spirit is doing. In Acts chapter 11, the whole church is just a step behind what the Spirit is doing. In Acts chapter 15, there is a major theological, ecclesiastical, evangelistic, missiological debate. But it's still God's church. Can you say amen? Amen. And the point is this, Luke does not paint some He doesn't paint some sunglasses picture of the book of Acts. He paints a human picture. These were real people with real issues and real stubbornness and real pride and real prejudice that really were not perfect, but they put their faith in a perfect savior. I want to say that again. They were ordinary people who were trusting an extraordinary Savior. Now, everything I've said up to this point, everything is is small potatoes, small compared to the last one. The last one. Everything up to this point, small compared to this one. Go to Acts 21. Go to Acts 21. And buckle your safety belt. I'll do the same thing. Put your seatbelt on for this one. Acts 21. In Acts 16, 17, 18, and 19, these are Paul's second and third missionary journey. Second missionary journey. It's very interesting that it says repeatedly that Paul went back to the churches, strengthening the churches. Okay. He went back to the churches. What word did I say? Strengthening the churches. Question. Question. If something needs strengthening, what is it? It's weak. Don't miss that. Several times in the book of Acts, it says that he strengthened the church. He strengthened the church. He strengthened the church. The implication is that the church was struggling. The church was weak in certain areas. It was, it was needing strength. It was needing puissance. It was needing power in certain areas. So Paul's out preaching his heart out, and he's just one man, and he's got Barnabas and Silas. And by the way, Paul and Barnabas and Silas and John Mark eventually kissed and made up. They got it all sorted out. They had a group hug. Hey, bro, it's it's good. We're good. It all worked out. The point is this. They were still human beings, just like you're a human being. The difference is not so vast as we would imagine between them and us. And I thank Luke for writing the book of Acts the way he did. So get to Acts 21. Paul's out preaching like crazy. Acts chapter 21, look at this. This is the big one. It says, um, verse 15, after those days, we packed up and went to Jerusalem. Also, some of the disciples from Caesarea went with us and brought with them a certain Manasseh of Cyprus, an early disciple with whom we were to lodge. And when we had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. Paul had been away for almost two years. So when Paul comes back, James is dead by this point, by the way. James has been killed by Herod. And uh, they're so happy to see Paul. Oh, Paul. Oh, it's good to see you, man. We just, there's, a, there's a real reunion. There's a real connection. I've seen many of my Arise students here and, and brothers and sisters that I've not seen in some cases for, for years. And when I see them, I just, it just thrills my soul to see them. And that's how it would have been with Paul. Oh, Paul, it's so good to see you. And Paul sits down. And he says, oh, let me tell you. Let me tell you what's been happening in Asia Minor. Let's, let me tell you what's been happening in, in my travels and in my journeys. Look at this. Verse 17, and when they had come to Jerusalem, the brethren received us gladly. The following day, Paul went in with us to James, and all the elders were present. And when he had greeted them, he told in detail the things that God had done through the, among the Gentiles through his ministry. And when they heard it, they glorified the Lord. Oh, that must have been awesome as Paul was recounting the way that God was moving among the Gentiles and the spirit and the way that they had endured persecution, but they had pressed on and their life had been supernaturally preserved. And you can just see the brethren just sitting right up on the edge of their seat. Oh, yeah. Tell us. Oh, really? And, and when it's all done and they're just basking in the glory of what God had done. Watch this. Watch this. Buckle your seatbelts. Verse 20. Second part. They say to Paul. 
you see, brother, how many myriads of Jews there are who have believed, and they are zealous for the law. Paul, you've been doing evangelism, we've been doing evangelism. And there's lots of new converts here, but they're, they're Jews, and, and they're very zealous for the law. And Paul, you know, you've been spending a lot of time with the Gentiles, so you're coming from a little different perspective. So we have an idea. There's, there's, there's rumors are going to get out that you're in town, verse 21. They have, been, they have been informed about you that you teach all the Jews who are among the Gentiles to forsake Moses, saying that they ought not circumcise their children nor walk according to the customs. Okay, this is huge. There was already a controversy in Acts 15 when Paul said to the Gentiles, you don't have to be circumcised. Paul said to the Gentiles, you don't have to circumcise. But now the rumor is out. The word on the street is that Paul is telling even the Jews that they don't have to circumcise their children. This is a bridge too far. James is, uh, not James, but the church, Peter, they're concerned. And so they approach Paul and they say, Paul, people are saying that you're getting rid of Moses. People are saying that you, you, you are disregarding the Mosaic law. Here's what we've got. We've got a plan. All of the Mosaic law. Verse 22. What then? What should we do then? What, what should we do about this? We've been thinking this through. We've got a good idea. Good public relations idea. The assembly will certainly meet and they will hear that you're here. Therefore, do what we tell you. We have four men who have taken a vow. Take them and be purified with them and pay their expenses so that they may shave their heads and that all may know that those things of which they were informed concerning you are nothing, but that you yourself also walk orderly and keep the law. But concerning the Gentiles who believe, we have written and decided that they should observe no such thing except that they should keep themselves from things offered to idols, from blood, from things strangled and from sexual immorality. Okay, so here's, here's what's happening. Phenomenal. The church sits Paul down and after, oh man, things are going great. Things are going awesome. Oh, Paul, it's so great to hear that. And then they say, now Paul, we have something very serious to talk to you about. There's a lot of new Jews who are converts and the word is going to get out that you're here and people are saying that you're disregarding Moses and the rumor is even that you're telling Jews that they don't have to circumcise their own children. But we've got it all figured out, Paul. Don't worry, we've got it all figured out. We've got these four guys over here who need to go through the rite of ceremonial purification from, from Jewish uncleanness. They're going to shave their heads, and they're going to go through the rite of purification. So we've got this figured out. What we want you to do is you go with them, you shave your head, you go through the rite of purification. In fact, you even pay their way, and when word gets out, oh... Paul, because he's been spending so much time with those icky Gentiles, because he's so... Paul himself is going through a purification. And he paid for others to go through a purification. And Paul, when the, when the Jewish... When the Palestinian Jews, who are now believers in Jesus, when they see this, they'll say, Oh, those rumors that we heard about Paul, those aren't true at all. And, they'll, and here's the point. Why are they doing this? I'll give it to you in one word. Politics. This is total politics. They don't want to stand firmly by Paul and by his ministry. So what they're trying to do is distance themselves slightly from Paul while getting Paul to come a little closer so everybody can just get along. Can't we all just get along? And beloved, I'm going to say this, and I'm going to stand right here and say this. There are church leaders today who have moved beyond appropriate politics to people-pleasing. They've moved, they've crossed the line, and, that, and the early church crossed the line. In fact, I'll tell you something very interesting. Do you know what Ellen White calls this? My, her word's not mine. My word was politics. You want to know what her word was? Cowardice. You know that word, cowardice? She says the church's decision to ask Paul to go through the rite of purification and to pay for the others to show, to seemingly show that he was in fact clean and pure, she calls it the fruit of cowardice. Now it gets worse. Not only are the brethren politicking 
and acting like cowards and people pleasers rather than doing what was right. They should have stood by Paul. They should have stood by his ministry. The Spirit was blessing his ministry. They should have said, whatever political fallout, whatever public fallout, whatever is going to happen to us, we're going to stand by Paul. We're going to stand by his ministry. We're going to do the right thing. We're going to do what is right because it is right. We're going to leave the consequences with God. But rather than being men at this point of principle, they became sort of jelly-like. And they tried to straddle the fence between endorsing Paul, but also trying to... And there's good politics and there's bad politics. And this was cowardice, Ellen White says. But it gets even worse. When Paul goes to the temple, Paul goes to the temple. He, he goes along with it. He was a big man, by the way. He knew it was wrong. He knew that what they were asking him to do was political, politically motivated, and wasn't the right thing. But he acquiesced to church leadership. And I need help with that. Some of you need help with that. He acquiesced to church leadership, even though in his heart of hearts, he believed they were making the wrong decision. He said, okay, I'll go along. But here's, here's the tragedy of it. Paul, for the first few days, is just fine. He's got his head shaved. Most of the people that Paul's baptizing are hundreds of miles away. But some of the Jews from Ephesus recognized Hey, that's Paul. That's the one. And Paul is recognized. And a great big um, tumult breaks out. A great big riot breaks out. And Paul is seized. And do you know where this ends? Do you know where this ends? I'll tell you where it ends. It ends with Paul's head on Nero's chopping block getting his head cut off. Did you know that the church's political cowardice prematurely caused the death of the greatest apostle that ever lived? Did you know that? That's biblical. That's Luke's book of Acts. In fact, Ellen White actually sheds a very interesting detail. She says that when Paul was thrown into prison, check this out, God still had things for Paul to do. We know that Paul was going to go to Spain. Anybody here tonight from Spain? Don't you wish we had the letter of Paul to Spain? Oh! Let me tell you, that was God's plan. But an interesting thing happened. Ellen White says, this is Ellen White, not me. She says that when Peter went into prison, when Peter was thrown into prison in Acts chapter 4, she says the brethren prayed earnestly. Oh God, please release Peter. Please, please. And because of the prayer of the earnest supplication and prayer for the brethren, an angel, angel was dispatched and Paul was, or Peter was released. But a very interesting thing. She says, the brethren did not pray for Paul like they had prayed for Peter. And the, the inevitable implication is that if they had, that Paul would have been released from prison. Not only did their political, people-pleasing, cowardly decision lead Paul into danger, when he got into danger, they did not earnestly pray because some of the Jews were very concerned about Paul's ministry. They, they didn't like it. Paul was, was a dangerous man. He was a man who was getting rid of Moses and doing away with Moses. And, and they, they were, Paul made them uncomfortable. And so, so they didn't pray for Paul like many of them had prayed for Peter. And because prayer is part of God's plan to grant us an answer to the prayer of faith, what he cannot bestow if we didn't ask, Paul, Paul, dies early, prematurely, because of the church's poor decisions. Let it sink in. Beloved, tonight we have gone to the other side of Acts. And we often read the book of Acts just like this. Oh, it's so great. 3,000 were baptized. The Holy Spirit was poured out. The conversion of the Gentiles. It was awesome, man. Our church today is dead. Our church today is unprincipled. Our church today is not strong and mighty like the early church was. We need to, and it is true. It is true that there are a great many beautiful things in the book of Acts. But there are two sides to this coin. We only, we only look at this side. 
I'm not trying to diminish the beauty and the power and the spirit that was manifested there, but this is not the only picture of the book of Acts. There is another very real picture that Luke paints, and it's a picture where there are theological misunderstandings. The church is wrestling with theological issues, just like today. The church is wrestling with contextualization and evangelism just like today, whether it's contextualization with the Muslims, contextualization with the unchurched. There's these major major controversies and people are on both sides. And there are people that have just literally drawn a line in the sand on issues that the Bible doesn't even speak directly about. And they're just literally ready to defragment the church on some of these issues over contextualization. We need... Take a breath, read scripture. The early church wrestled with how do we bring the gospel to the Gentiles? We are wrestling today with how to bring the gospel to the secular world. Can you say amen? And, and some people are saying, if it's not the way that we've always done it, it's not gonna work and we're not gonna do it. And then there are people on this side who are saying, well, we can do anything, anything goes. We can do, We need reasonable minds and reasonable voices and intelligent people like there were in some of the early church who will step in and say, it doesn't always have to be what we've always done and neither does it have to be anything goes. Let's figure it out together. Amen. And there was pride and pettiness and cultural divides. She's a black Adventist. He's a white Adventist. Caribbean, Jamaican, African, British, French, Spanish, blah. I'm not suggesting that there are not legitimate decisions, there are not legitimate divisions among us. And I'm going to talk about that in my third message. But the point is this, what unites us in Christ is far greater than what divides us. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. There were political issues in the early church. I I find myself sometimes disappointed in church leaders with the political decisions that they make. But guess what? I find myself sometimes disappointed in myself with the political decisions that I make. Anybody else out there want to confess that you sometimes do the people-pleasing thing and the cowardly thing? Or are you always a man of principle? You are always a woman of principle. Any other people out there that want to confess that you've blown it and it's not? Hallelujah! Early church. Beloved, the point is this, in the early church there was prejudice and there was pettiness and there were personal disputes and there was conflict and there was theological issues and there were ecclesiastical issues and there was evangelistic issues. And there was even politicking to such a degree that the greatest apostle that ever lived prematurely lost his life because of decisions made largely by the church. The church endangered Paul and didn't pray for Paul and Paul lost his life. And Paul was a champion. He took it. And beloved, I hope that through this... First of all, have you understood this presentation, yes or no? Raise your hand if you've understood it. Beloved, the message is loud and clear. These were ordinary people. These were ordinary people. People just like you. But they trusted an extraordinary God. These people were not perfect but they put their faith in a perfect savior. Can you say amen? Amen. And God poured his spirit out on them, not because of them, but in spite of them. We are facing monumental challenges in Europe. Can you say amen to that? I mean, we are facing huge challenges. We're gonna have to figure some things out. The early church had to figure some things out. There's going to be conflict. There's going to be division. There's going to be some controversy. But at the end of the day, we have to say, hey, I'm not perfect. You're not perfect. But I'm trusting Jesus. You're trusting Jesus. We're brothers. And let's do this in a way that would bring honor to the apostolic church. Ordinary people trusting an extraordinary God. Imperfect people trusting a perfect Savior. The book of Acts presents a picture of the church, the apostolic church, that is very, very similar to our church today. And I say, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus. So my appeal to you is to take your sunglasses. You can keep them. At times they're appropriate. Not these, Adam, not these. 
times it's okay to have your sunglasses on. But make sure you're reading the book of, maybe you're, make sure you're reading the Bible and make sure you're reading the books of the Bible as they were actually written. And not through some sunset, everything's okay, all thumbs up, everything's coming up roses perspective. What we need today are not superhuman people. We need ordinary people who are putting their trust in an extraordinary God. We need imperfect people who are putting their trust in a perfect Savior. And dare I say that just as God walked and moved with and through and by the early church, God will do the same with our church. God will do the same with our church. Can you say amen? Are there any ordinary people out there? Any ordinary people? Any imperfect people out there? Any petty people out there? Every single one of you should put your hands up. Any liars? Ordinary though you be, put your faith in an extraordinary God. Imperfect though you be, put your faith in a perfect Savior. And God will lead us from glory to glory, from Acts 1 to Acts 2 to Acts 3, right to the bitter end, and pray for our church leaders, from the local elder to the local pastor to the local conference president to the union president to the division president. Pray for our church leaders that God, in those moments of crisis, in those moments of difficulty, that God will give them the ability to stand for the right because it is right and leave the consequences with God. But also pray that God will give them wisdom not to make mountains out of molehills or molehills out of mountains. Will you join me in that? Will you pray with me in that? Amen? Stand with me and pray. Father in heaven, we have read the book of Acts tonight with new eyes. We have seen that it is not only a divine book in which your spirit moves and it does move mightily, but there are also some very telling human elements. And Father, when we put the composite picture together, we see a picture emerging, a picture that looks very similar to the picture that we see when we look in the mirror. Ordinary people, imperfect people, sometimes petty and prejudiced and pride-filled people, sometimes hypocritical, sometimes political, sometimes suspicious. Father, we are just the kind of people that need a Savior. We are just the kind of people that need a Savior to cover us, to change us, to better us, and to give us His Spirit. Father, as we continue to write the book of Acts, May we write it in the strength and power of the Spirit and not in the wisdom of man. I ask for the outpouring of your Spirit upon Europe, upon Seventh-day Adventists in Europe, and upon the GYC here, that these individuals will become difference makers, catalysts in Europe. And Father, that they will ignite small flames that become still larger flames and eventually catalyze into a grand and glorious picture that culminates and climaxes in the second coming of Jesus. Now is the time, now is the hour, and may we be your people at your time, in your place, doing your work and trusting your Son. And we pray in his name, Jesus Christ, let everyone say, let all of the ordinary people say, Amen.